Okay, hello, hello, happy Tuesday, everybody. My name is Karthik. I'll be with you this beautiful Tuesday morning for Real Estate Principles Chapter 11. I wanna take a moment and welcome you to the call today. It is an absolute pleasure to have you. If it's your first time here, you're in, uh, you've not been here for a long time, uh, don't worry about the fact that we're on Chapter 11. Uh, we'll go right back to chapter up to 15 and then back to chapter one. So it basically goes in a big Ferris wheel and the course material does not build on the prior lecture. So chapter 10 has nothing to do with 11. 11 has nothing to do with 12. So you can take these out of order and it will still be logical. So uh, don't freak out about the fact that, you know, we're in chapter 11 today. And again, if you're a guest today, just kind of hang out. I know you don't have your books yet, but if you're a guest today, just kind of hang out and um, if you like the program and if you do, we'd love to sign you up. Uh, just one quick thing, one customer service thing that I want to share with you. Um, the fastest way, if you guys need anything, you know, if you need help with anything, the fastest way to get service or support from our team is by starting a chat. So uh, while our phones get kind of busy, so if you need something uh, during business hours, just go to the website at the bottom right. You'll see a chat now link. If you chat in, we usually respond in under 60 seconds to that, and it's manned by our team at the office. So just a heads up, calling sometimes can be a little bit of a pain in the butt because there's a, sometimes a little bit of a wait. But if you chat in at the bottom right, uh, you know, you'll, you'll usually get a response in, in under a minute. So just a heads up. So this whole chapter is all about taxes. And candidly, there are three taxes that we're going to review this morning. One of those taxes are property taxes. Another tax is sales tax, and we'll end with an income tax discussion. So those are the three taxes that we're gonna talk about today, property taxes, sales tax, and income tax. And most of our time is gonna be spent here on 314 in this discussion about property taxes. Now, the biggest thing to remember about property taxes in California the most important thing by a mile is that we pay property taxes according to something called the assessed value of our property. So property taxes have nothing to do with the market value of a home. Property taxes in California are calculated on an entirely different set of value called the assessed value. Now, here's why this is important. And also, here's why this is a really good thing for real estate owners in California. If you look at the last three years, it's early 2023 right now. But if you look at the last three years from, let's say, 2020, just as COVID was kind of starting till today, have property values gone up or have they gone down in the last three years? They've gone up. They've gone up a lot in the last three years. In fact, some areas, particularly through 2020 and 2021, some areas were going up like 30% a year for two years in a row. Most people, myself included, would not be able to afford all my real estate if I had to pay property taxes as my values increased. My income did not go up 60% in the last two years. And most people would not, most people didn't have their income rise that much either. So it would be unfair to have me pay 60% more in property taxes just because my house went up 60% in the last three years. So in 1978, California voters passed something called Proposition 13. And Proposition 13 basically says the following. Number one, it says property taxes, middle of page 314, it says property taxes are ad valorem. You'll see that term ad valorem at the middle of page 314. And I wanna be clear that this sounds like ad value, but it doesn't mean ad value, it means according to value. We pay property taxes according to the value of our property. Now, according to what value? According to the assessed value. We pay property taxes not tied to the market value, but tied to a whole different set of value called the assessed value. Now, for this reason, if I told you my house was assessed at 600,000, 
you have no clue what the real value of my home is. My house could be worth 2.5 million, but I might still be paying property taxes on it like it was worth 600,000. So the point simply is, again, I'm kind of hammering this home because this is probably the most important thing from this chapter. Property taxes are not based on what the market value of your home is. They're based on what again? The assessed value, which again has nothing to do with the market value. Let me explain what I mean by this. Basically what happened in 1978 is that voters passed something again called Prop 13. Prop 13 basically says, I don't care. I don't care what happened to the market value of your property. The maximum increase in the assessed value is only 2% per year. So the maximum increase in your assessed value is only 2% per year. And by the way, you'll see this at the top of 315. If you look at 315 at the top, see those black squares there? That first black square, at the end of it, it says 2%. So the maximum increase in the assessed value per year is 2% per year. Now, what is your house appreciating at? Your house is probably going up 6 to 10% a year. So over time, what happens is the market value of your home goes up and up and up, but the assessed value cannot, by law, go up more than how much? 2% per year. So over time, you start to get this pretty wild increase in the market value, but the property taxes basically stay level. The property taxes can't go up more than 2% per year. So for example, let's say I bought my house in 2010 for 500,000. It's now worth 1.1 million. The property taxes basically stay the same. You have a 2% inflationary increase. I know inflation is more than that now, but the law said the maximum increase in the assessed value is only 2% per year. So again, for this reason, you could drive down a street in Beverly Hills where all the houses are worth five to $6 million. One person on the left might be paying property taxes on that $5 million house like it was only worth a million because they bought it 32 years ago. But the person on the right might be paying property taxes like it was worth $6 because they just bought the home. So the longer you stay in your house, the greater this gap starts to become. The longer you stay in your home, the market value goes up, 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 up. But the property tax assessed value cannot go up more than how much? 2% per year under Proposition 13. Now, a question for you. Is this good or bad for the homeowner? Amazing for the property owner. This is amazing for the property owner. Is this good or bad for the state? Well, it's not so good for the state. The state would love to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, now, by the way, California has a $90 billion surplus. So when people say California is broke, that's not true. Literally, we have a $90 billion budget surplus for the state of California. But still, the state would still love to tell you, hey, your house went up 30%, pay me 30% more in taxes, but they can't do that because of Prop 13. However, there are two things, and you might want to write these down on 315. There are two things that can cause the property tax assessed value to reset. There are two things that are known as reassessment events. And these reassessment events are things that basically cause the property tax assessed value to reset. Now, one thing, and you might wanna write this down on 315, one thing that can cause the taxes to reset are a qualifying sale. So a qualifying sale will cause the taxes to reset. So here's what that means. I bought my house for 500,000, it's worth a million today. I'm still paying property taxes on it like it was worth 500,000 because I'm protected under Prop 13. When you buy my house for a million or a million one, your new property tax basis, your new assessed value resets to 1.1 million. So one thing that can cause the property taxes to reset are a qualifying sale. So that's why, by the way, your parents, if there's, you're fortunate enough to have them still alive, your parents have, that have lived in their homes since 1980 
their house is probably worth a lot of money, but your parents' property taxes are very low because Prop 13 protects them. Another thing that can cause your property taxes to be reset are a major improvement to the property. A major improvement to the property. Now, what does that mean? That means you add on a fifth bedroom. You add on a bathroom. You do a major structural, let's say, addition to the property. This also causes the property taxes to reset. Now, the state loves both of these events because both of these events mean that all of us are going to be paying a little more in taxes. How does the, a lot of people say, well, how does the government know if I've added on to the property? Well, you probably got to pull permits. You pull permits, there's the red flag. The state's going to know that you've added on. The qualifying sale, the government forces you to tell them. You, by law, you have to tell the county assessor if you've sold the property. This qualifying sale is reported to the assessor. So just a quick review. Number one, the maximum increase in your assessed value is how much? 2% per year. Maximum increase is 2% for CESU, Proposition 13. How about this one? True or false? The market value is tied to the assessed value in California. False. The market value and the assessed value have nothing to do with each other. In fact, in most cases, your market value is going to be way more than the property tax assessed value. Now, if you look here on 316, there's about three or four state exam questions kind of locked in page 316. And you might want to look at a couple of things here on this page. First, the first thing I'd look at is the county assessor. And at the very top of 316, you'll see the term county assessor at the very top of 316. The county assessor determines your property tax assessed value. The county assessor determines your property tax assessed value. Now, here's something interesting. If you look here at the top of 316, how did the county assessor get their job? Notice at the top of 316, they are an elected official. The county assessor at the end of the day is nothing more than a politician. The county assessor is an elected position. And by the way, you might have read this about 10 years ago, the LA County Assessor was put in jail. And the LA County Assessor was put in jail because he allegedly, I guess I don't need to say allegedly because he was put in jail, but the County Assessor allegedly told his friends, hey, help me get elected. Once I'm elected, your house in Manhattan Beach, Beverly Hills, Holmby Hills, Brentwood, I know it's worth you know, 5 million, but we'll just reduce that assessed value. It's assessed at five mil. We'll just reduce that assessed value so that at the end of the day, you know, you pay less taxes. A junior assessor saw this and blew the whistle and that county assessor was put in jail. So if the question on the test were to say though, true or false, the county assessor is an appointed position by the governor. No, it's not an appointed position. It's a what? It's an elected position. Who is responsible for determining your assessed value? The county assessor is responsible for determining the assessed value. Now, right at the top of page 316, you'll see where it says, since such sale would trigger a reassessment, you must notify the assessor within 45 days of the transfer. So no later than 45 days of a property being sold, the county assessor must be notified of any change in ownership. Now, I want to be clear, now the assessor actually gives you 90 days to do it, but the test is still going to ask you about 45, so you might want to highlight that. Uh, a sale would trigger a reassessment, and the county assessor must be notified of any change in ownership within 45 days of the sale. Now, the good news for us is that the real estate agent isn't the one filling out this paperwork and you know notifying the assessor. The escrow company that you use will let the assessor know. Now, there's one other thing that we have to know because it's on the test, but not in the book. And you might want to write this down somewhere on page 316. The question on the test might say, how do you calculate your annual tax bill? How do you calculate your annual tax bill? Well, you would take, and you might want to write this down again because it's always on the test. 
you would take your assessed value and you would multiply it by the tax rate in your area. So to calculate your annual taxes, you take the assessed value and you multiply it by the tax rate. So for example, my house is assessed at 400,000. By the way, does this mean my house is worth 400,000? No, my house could be worth 2 million if I bought it 40 years ago. I'm still paying taxes on it like it's worth something a lot less. So it's assessed at 400,000. The tax rate in my area is let's say 1.25%. You would pay $5,000 a year in property taxes. I'm just taking the assessed value and I'm multiplying it by the tax rate in my area. So 400,000 times 1.25% gives us 5,000 a year in taxes. Now, the other question that's on the test, but not in the book, you might wanna write the words, who calculates the tax rate? We already know who calculates your assessed value. That's the county assessor. The tax rate in your area is determined by the county board of supervisors. So you might wanna write that down somewhere on 316. The tax rate is calculated by or determined by the county board of supervisors. So a couple, three questions for the test. Number one, to determine your annual tax bill, what do you do? You take the assessed value multiplied by what? The tax rate. Number two, who determines the assessed value in your area? The county assessor. How do they get their job? They were elected. It's an elected position in every county. Who determines the tax rate in your area? The board of supervisor. True or false, the assessed value is correlated to the market value of a home. False. The assessed value has nothing to do with the market value because the assessed value can't go up more than 2% a year. Market value is going up 5, 6, 8, 10, 12% a year. So over time, you're going to get this big disparity between the market value way up here and the assessed value way down here. Now, I want to get into um, one last thing, and then I'll take any questions. If you look at page 316 again, we know this already. The tax rate is determined by who? The County Board of Supervisors. The assessed value is determined by who? The County Assessor. Right? We talked about that again on 316. The rate is the Board of Supervisors. The assessed value is determined by the Assessor. Now, I do want to pause here for a quick second. Okay, well, we'll jump right back into it here. I want to respect your time and keep it moving. So if you look here, one other thing that I would note is, because it's always on the test, on 318, and the question is, how often do we pay property taxes in California? How often do we pay property taxes? We pay property taxes twice a year. And you can remember this by the acronym, no darn fooling around. So if you remember no darn fooling around, you'll never forget the due dates and the delinquent dates for property tax payments. The N and the D refer to the first installment. The F and the A refer to the second installment. So no darn fooling around. November 1st, the first installment is due. December 10th, the first installment is late. February 1st, the second installment is due. April 10th, the second installment is late. So again, if you never forget, no darn fooling around, you'll be able to remember the due dates and the delinquent dates for these tax payments. Now, Remember, taxes are always due on the 1st. Taxes are always delinquent after the 10th. Property taxes are always due on the 1st, delinquent after the 10th. Now, quick, easy questions we can get right on the exam. The second installment of county real property taxes is delinquent after what date? April 10th. When were, when were they due? February 1st. The first installment is due when? November 1st. Delinquent after when? December the 10th. Now, here's what's kind of weird about this. 
folks that look at these dates say, wait, 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 this doesn't make much sense. Surely November comes after February. Shouldn't February be the first installment? And shouldn't November be the second? Why is it that November is first and February is second? This seems backwards. The reason for that, and you might want to make a note of this on 318, the reason for that is that the property tax year doesn't start in January like a regular calendar year. The property tax year actually starts in July. So right now, we are in the 2022-2023 tax fiscal year. Come July 1st of 2023, we'll start the 2023-2024 tax fiscal year. So the point to this on page 318 simply is, when does the tax year run? Is it A, January 1st to December 31st, or is it B, July 1st through June 30th? Your answer, July 1st through June 30th. Since July is the start of the year, July, August, September, October, November, the first installment's due, December it's late. Then February of the next calendar year, the second installment's due, and April it's late. So you make your first payment November 1st of 2023, and you make your second payment February 1st of 2024. So again, quick, easy questions we can get right on the exam. The first installment of property taxes is due when? November 1st. Delinquent after when? December the 10th. The second installment is due when? February 1st. Delinquent after when? April the 10th. Now, the question that I sometimes get is, well, what happens on 319 and 320? What happens if I don't pay? my property taxes. What happens if I don't pay my taxes? Well, a couple of things. First, on January 1st, at the bottom of page 319, on January 1st, the state's computers put liens on everybody's houses. So January 1st is the lien date for non-payment of taxes. So if the question on the test were to say, between January 1st, February 1st, April 15th, or October 1st, the lien date is when? January 1st. If you don't pay your property taxes for five years, the government has the right to sell your property if taxes are not paid for five years. Now, during these five years, and by the way, you'll see this at the bottom of 320 on the left. If you look at where it says tax sale, Property can be sold if the taxes are not paid in five years. Now, I want to share two things with you. First, during these five years, you remain in undisturbed possession. So during these five years, the government doesn't knock on your door. They don't kick you out. You remain in undisturbed possession for five years. So... You might see that phrase, undisturbed possession on the exam. It's important to remember that during those five years, the state doesn't like knock on your door and harass you and you know follow you to Target and say, pay me or whatever it is. I mean, they don't do that. They leave you alone during these five years. Once the five years hits, it's going to be a bad thing because the property can be sold at auction. Now, a lot of people hear this, that the government leaves you alone in undisturbed possession for five years, and they say, I know what I'm going to do. I need a little bit of a, of a breather from my bills. I'm going to not pay my property taxes for five years, and the state leaves me alone anyway. This is going to be a little way for me to catch up on some other bills. You don't want to do this for two reasons, right? You don't want to miss your property taxes for two reasons. The first reason you really don't want to miss your property taxes is that every installment that you miss, there's a 10% penalty. So they have to, you have to pay a pretty hefty penalty for not paying your taxes, problem number one. Problem number two is that your lender, if you have a loan on your house, your lender is not going to be okay with you missing property taxes. Your lender can actually force foreclosure on you through something called an acceleration clause. So 
we talk about this in another chapter in chapter eight, but I just want to, I feel compelled to share this with you in this chapter, because a lot of people get the bright idea that, hey, I'm going to not pay my taxes for five years because they can't get rid of me anyway. But your lender will definitely make a face. Your lender is not going to be okay with you not paying your property taxes. And your lender can invoke something called an acceleration clause that basically can force you out of that property even before this five-year period. The state's going to leave you alone for five years, but your lender can trigger acceleration. Now, I want to share something with you here. Give me one second. I'll share my screen here in a moment. Um, there are many websites because a lot of a lot of folks take this class with me and they say, you know, I want to, I got my, I'm getting my license to be an investor. Um, if you want, and this is, there are many sites like this, but this is a website called bidforassets.com. And basically bidforassets.com is a way that you can search for uh, some tax sales. So again, this isn't on the test. I just know that many people hear this and they say, hey, wait, I can buy a house when somebody didn't pay their back taxes for five years. Yes, you can. How do you find those properties? There are many ways. This is one simple site that's free. So I can click California. There's 772 auctions. I can click it. And notice it says tax defaulted properties auction. And there's a bunch of things that you can look at kind of on your own. Now, I don't have an affiliation with the site. I'm not endorsing it. Use it at your own risk, all those things. But if you are interested in maybe having a look at uh, tax deed auctions, this is a place to do it, bidforassets.com. So if the question on the test were to say, how long do you have to redeem the property for non-payment of taxes? You have five years, right? There's a five-year redemption period. Now, I want to share one more thing with you. If you come forward to 322, if you come forward to 322 at the middle of the page, you'll see this gray box that says Mellow Roots. And the reason we need to talk about this is first, if you think of the street that you live on, let's say you live on, you know, Airport Drive or whatever, or uh, Chessman Lane, a lot of folks ask, well, who named my street? And Sometimes you'll see clusters of streets, like there are some streets that they're all the same development, 300 houses, and they're all named after flowers. Iris Lane, Lily Place, Snapdragon, Rose Avenue. And you're like, man, that's weird. A lot of those streets are named after flowers. How did that happen? Well, the street that you live on was named by the developer that built the houses. So when a developer builds a bunch of houses, he or she gets the privilege of naming the streets. The question then becomes, well, why do they get the privilege of naming the street? The reason that the government allows developers to name streets pretty much whatever they want is because they have to pay to put the street in. So if you're considering, and I think that'd be a pretty cool job, you know, buying 70, 80 acres somewhere and building a bunch of houses, that'd be a fun thing to do. Part of the budget, though, as you plan that, is not just the cost of building each house. It's also the cost of what we call off-site improvements, meaning streets, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, lights, sewage systems. Uh, basically, developers, again, don't just pay to put the houses in. The developers pay to like build the streets. And again, because of that, developers get to name the streets that they live on. There is a law called the Mellow Roos Community Facilities Act. Basically how this works is a developer can basically borrow money from an investment bank and float a bond issue. And the developer borrows the money to build the streets, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, lights, et cetera. Then the developer can leave all those homeowners for the next like 20 plus years with an additional assessment above and beyond their property taxes called Mellow Roots. So by the way, in Laguna Beach, there really isn't Mellow Roots in Laguna Beach. In Beverly Hills, there really isn't Mellow Roots in Beverly Hills. In downtown LA, condos don't really have Mellow Roots. Why? Because those streets are like 80 years old or more. 
there is no new infrastructure being put in in those communities. Now, if you look at places like, and I'll use some Southern California examples, if you live in Northern California or out of state, I apologize, I'm just not as familiar. But if you look at places like East Vale, places like Chino Hills, lots of Orange County, Ladera Ranch, you're gonna have Mission Viejo, Aliso Viejo, you're probably gonna have Chino Hills, you're gonna have Mellow Roofs in a lot of those newer communities. Why? Because the streets, sidewalks, curbs, gutters, lights, infrastructure are all newer. Now, again, you have to pay this as a homeowner. You have to pay this in addition to your property taxes. So the question then becomes, and you'll see this on the gray box, would you want to know whether or not a property you were buying had mellow roofs? Of course, you'd want to know. And you might want to notice the second sentence in this uh, gray box. It says, because of the confusion over the nature of mellow roofs, and the fact that they don't always appear on the tax bill, a seller must disclose the existence of mellow roofs. The seller must disclose the existence of a mellow roofs assessment. So three questions for the test. Number one, who bears the responsibility of installing streets, sidewalks, curbs, and gutters in a neighborhood? The city, the county, the state, or the developer? The developer. Number two, a developer can offload the cost of those infrastructure improvements onto residents in a neighborhood by floating a what? Mellow Roos bond. Who must disclose the existence of Mellow Roos? The developer must disclose the existence of Mellow Roos. So notice you're a property tax expert now. You know property taxes are based on the assessed value, not on the market value you know that whose responsibility is it to determine your assessed value? County assessor. How did the county assessor get their job? They were elected. Does the county assessor want to know if you sold your property? They do, because it's gonna trigger a reassessment. The assessor must be notified within how many days? Within 45 days of the transfer. Now, I wanna jump into sales taxes, but I do want to see uh, if there are any questions about property taxes uh, before we before we move on. So we'll jump right back into the deck here. I uh, appreciate the participation. Let me uh, reshare my screen here. And we will end on time today, as always. So if you look at page 324, you'll notice that the second tax that we have to talk about for a little bit on 324 are sales taxes on 324. And you'll see this at the bottom left on 324. And you've all know, you know what sales tax is. You go to a store and buy a shirt, whatever the shirt costs, it's $50. There's, depending on where you're located, there's nine and three quarters or 10 and a quarter or seven and three quarters percent sales tax that's charged on that piece of clothing. So all of us have experience with sales tax. The question is, is sales tax charged on real estate? And the answer is no. If you buy a house, it's not like you pay another nine and a quarter percent in sales tax when you buy a house. And thank God, by the way, that we don't pay that because that would crush our industry. If every time somebody bought or sold a house, and this is a pretty common uh, gripe that folks have with uh, even cars. If you buy a new car, you pay sales tax. If you buy a used car, you pay sales tax. And it's interesting because depending on how often that car gets sold over time, more money might be paid to governments in tax on the sale of that one car than was paid to you know Lexus for the cost of that car to begin with, depending on how often that car is sold. So thank goodness that same concept does not exist in real estate. In real estate, you do not pay sales tax when you buy or sell a home, building, or land. Question then folks have is, well, why is there a section in a real estate book on sales tax if sales tax is not charged on real estate? And the reason is because your real estate license in California will let you not only sell houses, but it'll let you sell businesses as well. And because, and by the way, sales tax is not charged on the sale of a business, but I'll give you an example. 
you know your real estate license lets you sell businesses. Imagine you sold a restaurant. Now, question for you. Do restaurants charge tax? Yes, restaurants charge sales tax. In a couple of weeks here, my girlfriend and I will go to a nice dinner for Valentine's Day. Uh, we'll split the check. That'll be even better. But uh, her and I will go to, let's say we go to a nice restaurant. We go to the Red Lobster, which is a fine restaurant. Now, we'll have a glass of wine in the car before we go in. Uh, but the point simply is, is dinner for two at Red Lobster will cost us $45 uh, for Valentine's dinner. They'll charge us tax on that meal. Red Lobster that night will collect the $6 in tax or whatever the tax comes to. Red Lobster will then take that $6 and Red Lobster will send it to the State Board of Equalization. Now, the State Board of Equalization is in kind of a weird spot because they're trusting every business in California to properly collect the sales tax and then properly remit that tax collected to the State Board of Equalization. Now, if you look at some smaller businesses, let's say... I got to get my hair cut here later this afternoon. Uh, the barber might try to sell me a bottle of gel or pomade or something. The bottle's 20 bucks. That barber is going to charge me $20 for that bottle of pomade. Plus, they're going to charge tax. The barber might take that money for tax and not actually send it up to the State Board of Equalization. Restaurants might do the same thing. Restaurants might take the tax money and not send that money properly to the State Board of Equalization. Here's the problem. If you're a real estate agent and you're helping someone buy a restaurant and that restaurant has $7,000 in sales tax that they were supposed to send to the State Board of Equalization, but they didn't, the new buyer of that restaurant, your client, is now responsible for those back sales taxes. That is a concept called successor liability. Successor liability basically says, and this is on the test, but not in the book, you might want to write successor liability somewhere maybe at the top of 325. Successor liability basically says that the buyer is liable for the seller's back sales tax. That word successor means the person coming next or the one coming after. The successor, the buyer, the next owner is liable for the seller's back sales tax. Now, at the top of 325, see at the top of 325 in bold where it says broker sales of manufactured homes at the top right of 325? Right above that in italics, you'll see the term tax clearance. Now, the state exam might call this a clearance receipt. So tax, clearance, clearance receipt, those basically mean the same thing. In fact, you might want to write clearance receipt there just so you know that those are synonymous. This clearance receipt or tax clearance is obtained from the State Board of Equalization anytime the business has no outstanding sales tax liability. So the reason that the state wants you to know this when you take the real estate exam is, hey, one day you might sell a business. If you're selling a business that collects tax, you got to know, advise your buyer to contact the State Board of Equalization and get a clearance receipt to show that the buyer isn't liable because the seller has no back sales tax liability to the BOE. So again, three questions for, for the test. Number one, the legal theory that says the buyer of a business is liable for the seller's back sales tax, successor's liability. Number two, who do you contact to make sure there is no successor liability? The State Board of Equalization. Number three, if there is no successor liability, what document do they give you? A clearance receipt or a tax clearance to show that there is no outstanding sales tax liability. So we have three taxes to talk about. The first tax was property taxes. We went over that. 
We know when property taxes are due, no darn fooling around. We know the difference between assessed value and market value. We know how our taxes are calculated. You take the assessed value times the tax rate, and that gives you the annual tax bill. We know who determines the assessed value. It's the county assessor. We know how they got their job. They were elected. We know what happens if you don't pay your property taxes. There's a five-year redemption period, and the property could be sold at a tax auction. Talked about sales tax. We know this isn't a concern if you're just buying or selling real estate because real estate transactions don't have sales tax. However, businesses that collect and remit sales tax like restaurants, retail centers, et cetera, those folks do collect tax. And it's critical to make sure when you represent a buyer that you verify with the BOE that there is no outstanding tax liability by obtaining a clearance receipt prior to the close of escrow. Now, the last tax we're going to talk about, and I want to start this and I'll take any questions you want to have. If you look at 326, are income taxes. And income taxes on 326 on the bottom left there are, in fact, you might want to write this word. I would write the word progressive. At the bottom of 326, income taxes are progressive. Now, what does progressive mean? Progressive means the more you make, the more you pay. The tax rate progresses as you make more income. Now, so if the question on the test were to say, between progressive, regressive, or a flat tax system, income taxes in our great country are what? Progressive, meaning the more you make, the more you pay. Now, broadly, there are two types of income that we should know about for our test. There's ordinary income, and then there's capital gains income. There's ordinary income and capital gains. And by the way, you'll see the term ordinary income at the top of 328, and you'll see capital gains at the middle of 328. So if you turn the page one time, you'll see ordinary income and capital gains income on 328. So first, next to ordinary income, I would write a handful of things. Ordinary income are your wages, your tips, your salaries, and your commissions. Wages, tips, salaries, commissions, these are all ordinary income. Capital gains income is money that you make from the sale of a capital asset. Money you make from the sale of a capital asset are capital gains income. Now, what's a capital asset? Capital asset could be like real estate. Could be like stocks. You buy $100,000 worth of Microsoft stock, you sell it because it went up, it's 180,000, great, you have an $80,000 capital gain. Now, question for you, something to think about. Do most people put food on the table for their family through ordinary income or capital gains? Just you, your family, your uh, coworkers, your friends that you know, most people make money on ordinary income. Most people go to work, and they get a check, and that's how they live. Wages, tips, salaries, commissions. Capital gains income is where you own something and sell it for more than you bought it for, like stocks, real estate, et cetera. Interestingly, and you probably know this, interestingly, you know that what is taxed at a higher rate, ordinary income or capital gains income? Ordinary income. People just going to work pay a higher rate on that income than income earned from the sale of a capital asset. That's why famously, you don't hear this as much anymore, um, but there was a time when Warren Buffett, for example, would say things like, I pay less in terms of a percentage of my income. I pay a, a lower tax rate than my secretary. Now, you shouldn't feel bad for a Warren Buffett secretary because it was reported that she was at the time making like over two fifty dollars or $300,000 a year. So she had a, um, a busy job, but a well-paid one. So in fact, if you look at many publicly traded CEOs, uh, you look at like Elon Musk or you look at any of these other folks, even Warren Buffett, they have salaries of a dollar or $10 or $100,000 relatively modest incomes because they don't want to get paid in ordinary income. 
They want to get paid in capital gains and they want to get paid in stock. So, and there's a bunch of ways when you get paid in stock that you don't have to pay uh, income tax. If you just borrow against the stock that you're awarded, you can have a pretty nice life and pay no tax, frankly. So the point simply is, is that there are two types of income, ordinary income and capital gains income. Ordinary income, we know what it is. Ordinary income is taxed, generally speaking, at a lower rate than long-term capital gains income is. Now, here's something interesting about real estate investors. Real estate investors are almost treated like a protected class with white gloves. Real estate investors are really in a good spot because there are a handful of what times when you could sell a piece of real estate and not pay any tax. And I wanna share those two with you now. So first, if you look here on 328 at the bottom where it says tax considerations for the homeowner, you'll see this at the bottom of 328 and the top of 329. So essentially, when you sell your primary residence, and when I say primary residence, you can only have one primary residence at a time. When you sell your primary residence, there is a time when you can make money on the sale. You could tell the government that you made money on the sale and the government just gives you a high five and says, you know what? Nice work. Just keep it all. You're good. You don't owe us anything. The way this works is if you sell your home that is your primary residence that you have lived in for two years out of the last five years. Now, a lot of people, I don't know why, but a lot of people get hung up on, well, what does two years out of the last five mean? Well, look at today. It's basically February of 2023. Go back five years. That would put us at February of 2018. Within that five-year block, have you lived in it for two years out of the last five? So if someone said, hey, I bought my house in 2010. I lived in it from 2010 to 2015. It's been a rental home from 2015 till now. Can I do this? No, because you've been out of it for too long. If you want to do this, you have to move back in, wait there for two years, and then do it. How much can you make? Well, it depends. Are you married or happy? I mean, are you single or married? Forgive me, I didn't mean that. It's a, a slip. If you're single, the first $250,000 is tax-free. If you're married, the first $500,000 is tax-free, meaning you don't pay tax now, you don't pay tax ever. It's just tax-free. The nice thing is you can redo this every two years. This rule, this is called Section 121 of the Internal Revenue Code. This rule passed in 1997 under Bill Clinton. Before this, like once in your life, you could beg the IRS and once in your life, you could get cut a break. Now it's super simple. Number one, have you lived in the home for two years out of the last five years as your primary residence? Yes, great. Number two, are you single or are you married? If you're single, the first 250,000 in gain, and when I say gain, I mean the difference between what you bought it for and what you sold it for, uh, and you'll probably have, you know, you'll have cost of acquisition, you'll have cost to sell it, you might have capital improvements, but you'll calculate how much you're in the house for versus what you sold it for. And if you've made 250,000 or less, you don't pay any income tax on that, neither state nor federal. Married, the first 500,000 in gain, also tax-free. You don't pay tax now, you don't pay tax ever, you just keep it all. How often can you redo this? Well, because you need to have lived in it for how long? Two years. You can redo this every how often? Two years. Because you only need to live in it for two years out of the last five. You don't need to live in it five years. You just need to have lived in it for two years out of the last five years. Now, can you do this to a shopping center? No. This only applies to what? Your primary residence. It's only for your primary residence. For investment property, we have another rule for investment property that you might have heard of called a 1031 exchange at the bottom of 331. So at the bottom of 331, the 1031 exchange basically goes like this on 331. Imagine you bought a shopping center for $5 million. 
in you know, 2003. You're going to sell it for $15 million you know, 20 years later. You have a problem. It's a good problem, but it's still a problem. You just made 10 million bucks. If you sell that property and cash out, you're going to owe a pretty hefty tax bill. So what do you do? Well, you could sell the shopping center for 15 million, just like a normal sell. You list it with a real estate agent. The agent finds a buyer. The escrow closes. You sell it for 15 million. Now that $15 million in, uh, that you sold it for, if you roll that money over into the purchase of another investment property within 180 days, you can defer the tax liability until you cash out. So this is one major reason why real estate investors tend to get rich a little quicker. Real estate investors tend to get rich a little quicker because you might have heard stories where maybe an investor starts with a little, you know, rundown two unit building somewhere. And all of a sudden, 60 years later, you know, they own 5,000 apartments. The reason that you hear that story with, you know, not every day, but you hear people doing that over time as investors is because real estate is very unique in that the government, again, I told you that the government looks at real estate investors with white gloves. They're like, hey, you know what? I know you just sold that shopping center and made a ton of money, but I'll tell you what, just reinvest that in another investment property and you can roll all that money over into the purchase of the next investment property, which is why real estate investors can get rich a little quicker because every dollar that they make can be rolled over into the purchase of other investment real estate without necessarily having to pay federal or state income taxes on the game. Imagine you bought some Tesla stock and you sold it for more than you paid for it. If imagine you tell the IRS, hey, I'm going to take that Tesla gain that I made from the sale of the Tesla stock and I'm going to buy, you know, Alphabet stock with it, or I'm going to buy, you know, Apple stock with it. I don't want to pay any tax. The IRS is going to say, hey, I don't care what you do with the money. You can buy other stock with it. You can go get plastic surgery. You can go take a vacation. You can go gamble away in Vegas. I don't care. You bought the stock, you sold it for more than you bought it for, you owe us tax. But in real estate, as long as you roll that investment property income into the purchase of other investment property within six months, the government doesn't require that you pay tax at the time of sale. Now, here's something interesting also. Real estate agents love clients that are in these 1031 exchanges. Real estate agents love clients in 1031 exchanges. And let me explain why. If you hire me to sell your shopping center, you're going to pay me a commission when I sell it for 15 million. You're going to owe me money. Fine. What do I know you're going to have to do within the next six months? Buy other investment property. And do you think clients get more picky or less picky as this clock starts to tick down? They get a lot less picky. So real estate agents that do investment real estate sales, a lot of these agents only have like 10 to 20 clients. That's it. They have 10 to 20 clients and they give them great service. They return calls immediately. They are on top of these 20 clients because these 20 clients are buying and selling all the time. So as long as they have a book of business that's constantly buying and reinvesting and selling, they can make a great living doing it. And your license will let you do that. Now, one thing I want to share with you is I put 45 days to identify replacement and a maximum of 180 days to close. Here's what I mean by that. If you hire me to sell that shopping center for you, I sell the shopping center. You now have 45 days to identify replacement properties and then 135 more days to close escrow on one or more of those properties. So you have 45 days to identify a replacement and then 135 days to close. So the whole thing can't take more than 180 days. There's a 45 day, it's called a nomination period where you get 45 days to like, you know, figure out a property you might want to buy. And then a maximum of 135 days to close out the 180 to close escrow. One other thing I'll say, and this is not a class on 1031 exchanges, but I want to put this out there. On the 1031, when you sell that shopping center for 15 million, you cannot touch the money. 
when you sell that property for 15 million, the money has to sit with an accommodator, which is basically a third party that holds the money for you. And then when you find the next property you want to buy, the accommodator moves that money into the next escrow for you. So the point is, is that philosophically and actually, you cannot touch the proceeds. You're literally rolling that money from one property into another. So if you take that 15 million and put it in your own account, the exchange fails. You have to use a third party called an accommodator in order to facilitate the exchange. So again, the thought is you don't have control of the money. You're literally rolling it from one investment property to another. Now, by the way, can you do this 1031? Can you do this to your primary residence? No. Remember, 1031 is for investment property. Now, it could be an investment rental house. If you have a rental home that you don't live in that's been a rental, you can do a 1031 into or out of that. One other thing. The 1031 exchange is also sometimes called a like, L-I-K-E, a like kind exchange. And the reason that it's called the like kind is not because a shopping center has to be exchanged for another shopping center. It's like kind in that investment property is exchanged for other investment property. So I can sell my shopping center and buy an industrial warehouse. I can sell my warehouse and buy some raw land. I can sell the raw land and buy an office building. But it is investment property for other investment property. It is not shopping center for shopping center or land for land. It's investment real estate for other investment real estate. So that's the discussion on income taxes. We know ordinary income versus capital gains. We know some of the rules when you sell your primary residence. We talked about 121. Rules when you sell investment property, we talked about 1030. Or by the way, or if you wanted to sell a piece of real estate and just cash out, cool, cash out and pay the tax, that's fine. You don't have to roll it over, but a lot of folks do just because they want to defer the capital gains. And by the way, I want to close with one thing and I'll take any questions you might have. On the 25500 with your primary, am I saying on your primary that you have to buy another house with this money? No, this is a complete tax-free sale. You can go move back in with your mom. You can rent a hotel in Miami. You can buy another house. You can do whatever you want with this money. You don't have to roll the money over on a 121 primary residence sale like you would on a 1031. The 121 is a complete tax-free sale. You don't pay tax now. You don't pay tax ever. It's just tax-free. 1031 is an exchange. It's a tax deferral. You're saying, I'm going to roll this money into the purchase of another investment property. And because of that, I don't have to pay the tax today. It is a deferral, not a tax-free sale. So you do have to buy another investment property. You don't have to buy another house. So all great questions. As always, nothing I've said today should be construed as tax or legal advice of any kind. Tonight, if you hop on at 6.30 tonight, we'll do chapter 12. By the way, 12 and 13 are two really important chapters. Tonight's on landlord-tenant, and then tomorrow morning is on appraisal. And those are two super important chapters. So if you can help it, try to make it for today and tomorrow. We'll catch you guys tonight. Thank you so much.